Hello, thank you for joining me as we continue our study through the book of Deuteronomy tonight. My name is Pastor Damien. I serve as a lead pastor of Cornerstone Chapel, and I'm excited to be going through this series. This is week 17, and we are going to continue through uh, with our focus together forever. See, the book of Deuteronomy serves as a foundational piece to understand how God acts and moves and speaks and leads and directs throughout the rest of the Old Testament. It's an invitation to know his heart and his intention. And sometimes, if you remember what it was like to be a child, you find yourself facing rules and boundaries that didn't make a lot of sense, may have seemed exceptionally frustrating, and even in moments we chose to rebel against them. But now as we look back as adults, we see the wisdom that our parents had, and we, had, we see and understand the love that was truly behind their heart and what motivated put them to put these uh, certain laws and structures in place, right? And so today, as we look at Deuteronomy chapter 12, we're going to be looking at how God invites us to worship him or how God invited Israel to worship him. What was it going to look like? What was it going to be like? Is it anything that they had experienced before while they were in Egypt? Can they make it up as they're going? Can they choose to worship God like the people in the land that they're about to go and move into? We'll find out those answers together as we go through Deuteronomy chapter 12. But before I begin, I want to open us up with a time of prayer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that it is alive. And even though these words were spoken through your servant Moses so many years ago, Father, they speak to us today. They are a present invitation in your spirit who breathes life into them to know you, our Lord, our God, our loving Father, who desires to do life with us forever. So I pray, Father, may you speak to us through your spirit tonight. May you lead us to see you in all truth. And may our hearts continually be shaped to worship you in your holiness for who you are, Father, and who you are inviting us to step into. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Deuteronomy chapter 12. And if you have your study notes, kudos to you. They're available uh, below in the comment section on whatever uh, media platform you're choosing to watch this under. But we're going to go ahead and get started. We've divided up this chapter into four parts. We're going to be looking at how not to worship the Lord our God. Then we're going to look at how to worship the Lord our God. We're going to look at the difference between what it is to worship God corporately, that means together, and what it looks like to worship God individually in our own homes. And then finally, we're going to look at what it would look like for Israel as they would grow, as they would become more numerous and strong as a nation. Were these just training wheels that God had given them? Or was this a structure that was meant to grow with them as they would continue to grow up in the land of promise? So let's begin. We're going to look at the first four verses of Deuteronomy chapter 12. Would you read with me? It says, and these are the statutes and the rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess served their gods on the high mountains, on the hills, and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars, dash them in pieces, their pillars, and burn their ashram with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of the place. In verse 4, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. Now, why is God so focused on them when they go into the land of promise to search out these places of idolatrous worship and destroy them? Why does God want even the name and the memory removed from the land for his children as they go in to possess? Now, remember, Israel was going to step into a land that had been given to them by God, a land that they were going to drive out the inhabitants whose sin against God had reached such a height that judgment had come upon them. Now, this was a very unique situation, very unique circumstances, and in a very unique period of time in which God is working his judgment through the nation of Israel. This is not a blueprint for you and I to physically go out and destroy our neighbors and destroy the things uh, that are around us that are not honoring to God. What this is, is an invitation for you and I to understand the seriousness of who God is and how we, what we're reading that they were to do in the land, 
how we are empowered to break down the idolatrous worship in our own heart, in our own lives, which is a far more real battle uh, that we would face and that they would face. And we'll see this played out. But in the first four verses, we see that God encourages them to do what? Verse one, these are the statutes, the rules. Be careful. To be careful means that we are intentional to hear what God is saying, to listen and understand what God is saying so that we can live accordingly. And as a parent, I'll have conversations with my kids all the time when we lay down rules and, and do you understand what I'm saying? They'll hear, but they don't necessarily process and understand it. And then what happens, we find ourselves in a circumstance <coughs> excuse me, where they have disobeyed. And now we come back to the point of, okay, what happened? Why did you choose to do something that was against the rules? And often we'll come to a place to where I didn't understand that's what you meant, Dad. And so what Israel is being encouraged to do with God right here is to make sure that you understand. Now is the time to ask your questions for clarity before we get into the land of promise, before there is a very real consequence for choosing to disobey God. Now remember, this is a very loving father who wants to protect his kids from going in directions that will bring damage to them and to their families because God is a God who wants a relationship with us forever. And so begin by understanding who God has revealed himself to be. What are the rules and what are the expectations from us by God and how we live with these rules? And then it continues on. Now, in verses two through four, Israel was to go in and destroy, to knock down all their altars, all their high places, and to erase the names of the false gods and the worship from the land. They were to eradicate the memory as well as the invitation to worship God as the other nations worshiped him. So by removing these opportunities, these venues to worship other gods, it would remove the invitation, the temptation for the people of Israel when life is going either so well that they forget God or life is going so hard that to be faithful to God is so challenging that they'll look for other opportunities to, ex to to just pursue. God wants to remove these obstacles, but it's not just removing them so that they're not, the people of Israel are not invited to worship other gods, but there's also this very real uh, understanding that God wants Israel to have that God is not to be worshiped like these other people worshiped their gods. See, our God is not to be worshipped like the Muslims worship their God. Our God is not to be worshipped like the Buddhists worship their gods. Our God is not to be worshipped like the Hindus worship their gods. Our God is the God, a holy God, and he is defining what it is to do life with him. We are created. He is the creator. He defines what this life with him is to be and how it's to unfold, how to have this healthy relationship with him. And so removing these obstacles, these invitations to worship other gods, was also erasing the rhythm of worship that God would not accept. God would not accept Israel worshiping him the way that these other gods were worshipped by the people of the land that God's judgment was coming in. So that, the first four verses, how not to worship God. So how do we worship God? We know that God doesn't want to be worshipped like uh, people have worshipped their other gods. We know that God is to be worshipped. So what does it look like to worship God the way that he desires? Well, he doesn't leave us to guess. The next uh, three verses, verses 5 through 7, show us how to worship the Lord our God. It says in verse 5, Deuteronomy 12, But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and to make his habitation there. There you shall go, and there you shall bring your burnt offering and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your households, and all that you undertake, in which the Lord your God has blessed you, has blessed you. So understand, God is going to show them what worshiping him is to look like. 
he is going to choose the place. They're not able to go and just make up any place that they want. They're not going in as church planners to look for a good place that seems like it would be a good opportunity to share the love of God. No, this was this is a very infant state in God's story of redemption. And just like being children, we have incredible opportunity that we have to grow up into. And we have harder rules as a child than we do as we mature. But we cannot be treated as if we are mature because we will fail. So these harder rules are now here with Israel. And God was going to choose a specific place that all of the families of Israel would have to come and worship. See, corporate worship is a very real element. By corporate worship, I mean... Everybody coming together to celebrate God. What did this corporate worship embody? That you would come and you would bring your sacrifices. You would bring your tithes and you would bring your contributions or offerings and then present them to God. You would present of your flocks, your herds, all that God would bless you with was meant to be tied into the corporate worship setting. There they would eat before the Lord their God and would rejoice. They'd celebrate the relationship that they had with God. It wasn't just them individually with God. It was them corporately. They are together God's children. It's like family dinner. Family dinner was important to God. That's what corporate worship is. It's a time where it matters not what is going on. You hit pause, you stop, you take a break, and we gather to the table to celebrate family, life, and love. And that's what this corporate worship setting mentality is. And this is why it's important to God. We have to remember that we're his children. We have to remember that love is the foundation to our relationship with him and each other. You shall not do according that, uh, to all that we are doing here today, everyone doing what is uh, right in their own eyes. This leads us into the second part. Um, I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but I wanted to, to just kind of show the contrast to where what God is introducing here is not coming naturally to them. There is not a desire to come together and worship corporately. You ever have those moments on Sunday morning that you just don't feel like getting up and going to church? Well, guess what? That's human nature. We do not like to gather together and to worship God corporately. And over time, that might change, but we have those moments to where it's a struggle. In the nation of Israel right now, this idea of corporate worship was not something that they were naturally aligned towards. They would have to be careful, as verse 1 said, to understand that this is what God is asking and requiring, and they would have to be intentional to follow through in obedience to God in regard to worshiping together as family. Now, this, this isn't something that's unique to just Israel. It's also something that plays into your and my life in the New Testament church today. Listen to this. In Paul's letter to the 1 Corinthian believers, chapter 1, verse 2. Oh, pardon me, so I need to sip on that Earl Grey. It's been an exceptionally long day. Hence, recording this video with night in the backdrop. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, listen to this. The church of God that is in Corinth, those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints individually, no, together with all those in who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. See, the church is the collection of saints. Those are men and women who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. The term saints means that they are set apart, sanctified, made holy in relationship with God. And as they would gather together corporately in Corinth <clears throat> on a specific time, the, the Lord's Day, that while they were together, they were supernaturally connected with other believers in communities that had gathered other corporate worship settings together representing the kingdom of God. We refer to this as a universal church. That is everybody that makes up by faith the family of God. Where you worship on Sunday mornings is a piece of that. And it's important that we are a part of that. We'll look at that as we continue. But understand this idea of corporate worship is very present in the Old Testament and it stays in the New Testament. Why? Because corporate worship is like God calling us all to have family dinner together. It's a time to celebrate. It's a time to testify. It's a time to be instructed, to be encouraged, to answer questions, to be strengthened and confirmed in the love that we have together as family of God, as his children. It's important to him then. It's important to him today, and it will forever be important to him. That's why it, we're, the heaven is referred to as the marriage feast, a 
table that we sit at with the Lord God. But continuing now, keeping and maintaining God as the center of our lives would overflow the blessing of that relationship into families and communities. Verse 7, and there you will eat before Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your households, your families, meaning that dads don't just go to church, moms don't just go to church, parents don't drop their kids off at church. No, moms and dads and kids together go and worship the Lord in this corporate setting. The relationship that they had with God kept central would overflow into the relationship. They would lead by example. And I wanted to read a little bit. Uh, in your outline, I've, I've encouraged you to read from Ephesians 5, verse 15, all the way through Ephesians 6, verse 9. And what I love that Paul does there, and we do this in our premarital counseling, is that central, when we have Christ central to us, that overflows into the relationships we have, in particular to our spouse and marriage. It overflows into our parenting with our children. It overflows as our children to parents and parents to children. It overflows into our employments, our jobs. If we get God wrong, if we do not have Jesus central, everything else becomes skewed and goes in different directions than what God has created and intended. And even when we have God central, they don't always go according to plan. We can't control how people respond, but we can control who we are in Christ. And that's what this encouragement is. And I want to read Ephesians 5. I am going to read a few verses, uh, starting with verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Again, what does it say? Look carefully. How did Deuteronomy 12 begin? Be careful. See, we have to be intentional to understand what it is that God's saying. Not just hear, understand, and be willing to pursue being obedient. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Does that not sound like what we just read in Deuteronomy? Chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. And therefore you shall rejoice, you and your households, and all that you undertake, because God's going to overflow blessing. But it begins by who Jesus is, and is he central to our life with God and each other. So we've looked at how not to worship God. We can't go and worship God any way that we want. We can't worship God the way that Buddhists or Hindus or Muslims or others. You might think, oh, wow, that looks pretty neat. Why don't I bring that into? no. We must worship the Lord our God as he has declared worships to be. Why? It seems unfair, Pastor, because he's the creator, not just the creator. We mess things up by sin. God stepped in through his son to defeat sin, break the bondage, and deliver us through the shedding of his son's blood in order for you and I to be reunited with God and with him forever. So from where I'm standing as a sinner that's saved by grace, the question does not become, God, why are you too restrictive? The question becomes, God, help me to understand everything that you are so that I may not even sin against you in the slightest imaginative error of my own heart and mind. I love you so much, God, because you have loved me. See, that's the heart that is responsive by recognizing who I am. I am a sinner that had been saved by grace through Jesus Christ. God owns me. He owns my mind, my heart, my thoughts, my affections, and my life purpose is to cultivate that into maturing in him, in him. And so let's continue now. What is corporate worship? We've talked about we've, this corporate worship setting, but is that what life is supposed to be? Are we supposed to live at church or is there an overflow into our homes? Let's look at verses 8 through 19 now of Deuteronomy chapter 12. You shall not do according to all that you are doing here today, everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. Huh, for you have not as yet come to the rest inheritance that the Lord your God is giving you. But when you go over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, when he gives you rest from all your enemies around so that you live in safety, then to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there, there shall, uh, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tithes and contribution that you present, uh, that you present, and your finest vow offerings that you vow to the Lord." And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. And you and your sons and your daughters, your male servants, your female servants, and the Levite that is within your towns, as he has no portion or inheritance with you. 
Take care that you do not offer your burnt offerings at any place that you see, but at the place that the Lord your God will choose in one of your tribes. There you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I am commanding you. So there we have it, all the way up to verse 14, what corporate worship is to look like. Again, it's this reinforced idea that it's a place that God chooses, that everyone is to come and to gather and to give their vows, give their offerings, their sacrifices, their tithes, and their offerings. Now, remember, the Levites were chosen to do what? They were priests. They ministered between God and the people, as Moses and Aaron were ministering between God and the people. They were training and equipping Israel to understand the Lord their God, to be careful. How were they to be careful? Because the Levites would teach them what it was to do life with God. They would teach them the law. So they would train and equip Israel to do the works of of kingdom relationship between them and God. And <clears throat> gathering together corporately would ensure that everyone was receiving correct instruction, not doing what was right in their own eyes. And this would involve being encouraged if we're going a good direction or being reprimanded, rebuked in love and corrected as a father corrects a child that he loves. <clears throat> All of this was to take place in this corporate setting. But the Levites would not have an inheritance of the land, so part of that tithe and offering and sacrifice would go into providing for the Levites, whose role was to feed the nation of Israel, to know God, understand God, and to walk accordingly with God. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Uh, allergies coming in. Praise God for spring, right? Um, but either way, the allergies are the unpleasant side of things. Praise God for Earl Gray. All right, sacrifices, tithes, offerings would be brought and given the appointed place of worship. One other thing that I did want to note before we move on from this is that you have not, verse 9, come to rest in the inheritance that the Lord your God has promised you. And again, this is the reminder that, in, and we've heard this growing up, Damien, you're not a teenager yet. Damien, you're not 16 yet. You can't drive. Damien, you're not 18 yet. Damien, you're not 21 yet. We we have growing up these benchmark uh, age accomplishments that when we arrive, we, we have a sense that, wow, I've arrived. But until we get to that point, we can't get there fast enough. And what Moses is encouraging, what God is encouraging through Moses is for them to recognize that these rules are meant to protect them and allow them to know the fullness of the joy that God has for them. And God is setting them up so that they can, in a healthy way, grow and mature and expand to know the riches of his blessing of doing life with him. So be patient, be patient. And so it continues now, uh, verses 15 through 19. We looked at the corporate worship uh, twice now, and this is this is pretty heavy. But now let's look at what it was like to do life with God on the home front. How are we to live? What did life look like outside of the corporate worship setting? Verses 15 through 19. <clears throat> However, you may slaughter and eat meat within your own towns as much as you desire, according to the blessings of the Lord your God that he has given you. The unclean, the clean may eat of it as a gazelle and as a deer. Only you shall not eat the blood, you shall pour it out on the earth like water. You may not eat within your own towns the tithe of your grain or of your wine or of your oil or the firstborn of your herd or your flock, or any of your vow offerings that you vow, or your free will offerings, or the contribution that you present. But you shall eat them before the Lord your God in the place that the Lord your God will choose, you and your son, your daughter, and your male servant, your female servant, and Levite who is within your towns. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in all that you undertake. Take care that you do not neglect the Levite as long as you live in your land. So when Moses is saying now, or got through Moses, remember, is, is speaking to the people of Israel that it's okay what is required of God, bring to God corporately. But anything beyond that is yours. And as God blesses and increases, we have a right to enjoy what it is that God brings into our lives. And 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 sometimes I think we 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 miss this a little bit when we look at uh, corporate worship as being uh, this 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 highlight, and that everything else is secondary to it. No, it's all on one level plateau. I mean, it's the sense that um, corporate has its place as well as everyday life and worship and relationship to God. And and for the uh, nation of Israel, they were to enjoy God was blessing them to bring joy into their lives, joy of his presence and all that his presence would bring them. But they were not to neglect the corporate worship. And this is why God intertwined it so much, because uh, it, it's a challenge when you have to travel to go to church. I mean, I talk to people that even driving 15, 20 minutes is too much to get to a church and they want something closer. I mean, it's outrageous. 
when I was growing up, I can remember uh, when we had, my father was in Bible college and he wanted to go to another church that taught more along the lines of the conviction that he was growing into. And the church uh, that we originally were going to that I grew up in was about 15 minutes from home, if, if that. But the church that we ended up going to uh, during my father's time in school was uh, over an hour's drive one way. And we made that drive every Sunday, um, Sunday night and Wednesday. And it was just that important to us because it was, it was community, it was worship, it was corporate worship. And we didn't think twice about it. Um, I'm sure there were some drives that were not pleasant in times that my parents didn't feel like going, but we did. And it's a sense that without God connecting them together like this, they would naturally disconnect. Well, I don't need to go to church. God is very much present here in my home around our own dinner table that he is in that corporate setting, or in the sense that corporate setting is what it's all about. It's the most important thing. And make sure to pour all that you have into it, even at the point to where you have nothing at home. Give to the Lord, even to the place to where you have nothing left to eat your own, of your own self and, and feeding your own families. And see, God wanted this balance to be to be to be there so that they understood trust god give him what he's asking and he will provide for you all that you need there's a very spiritual kingdom principle in this we'll talk more about that later on but i did want to i did want he mo, he closes in verse 19 with remembering the levites do not neglect them why why were the levites we talked on this they were to train teach and train israel to know god's law to understand it and to walk accordingly to what God has has defined as worship of him, everyday life with him. It's important to, to, I don't know if I elaborate on that, but worship of God is everyday life with God. Worship isn't what we do on Sundays. Worship is every moment of every day. Every part of who we are is worship before God. But in 1 Timothy, uh, I want to read verses 5, uh, for 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. And this Greek word elders uh, refers to bishop, pastor, elder. It's your, it's, it's in the Old Testament would be the priest. New Testament, it's your pastors, it's your elders, your teaching uh, elders. Uh, those that God has empowered and trained with maturity in his word to, to, to replicate, to train, to know God, understand God, and walk with God accordingly. The scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, for the laborer is deserving of his wages. And what this means is, in the New Testament, the believers, the saints, were encouraged to remember the same. Do not neglect caring for those who have been called and anointed by God to preach and to teach his word to you and to your families. This was how God's structure of corporate worship was to be kept in place and to overflow into blessing the home life of those who would populate that corporate setting. And then finally, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, um, we're going to look at uh, verses 20. Uh, all the way, uh, let's go to verse, uh, I only had us going to verse <clears throat> 28, um, and we'll see, we'll see where we're at time-wise on this, uh, but looking at verses 20 uh, through 28 now, it says, when the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he has promised you, and you say, I will eat meat because you crave meat, you may eat meat whenever you deserve. And the, the, I'm going to, there's so much, but in the New Testament, when they would sit down to have communion, there were those who were being neglected because they would have a, a feast. It was referred to as a love feast. And they would be so gluttonous in this that there wasn't enough for everybody. And it would be a, like having a potluck at church and everybody brings, and then the first group goes through and there's nothing left by the time that, that the rest of the people get up to the table. And there are those who are so overindulged that they can't move, like their stomachs are about to explode. And you have those who are in hunger pangs. And and, and, what God, and what Paul said, do you not have homes to eat in? You know, don't come like that to, to the corporate worship. Come with the, with the desire. Look, if you're that hungry to where you're going to kill it at the buffet line or at the potluck, have a bagel or something on the way to church. I mean, prepare yourself for this so that you're not given to gluttony. Because gluttony is indulgence for, for you, but it's at the expense of the person who comes up in the line after you. And that's the same principle that's coming back here. Where Moses is saying, take care that you do, uh, when the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he's promised you and you say, I will eat meat because you crave meat, you may eat meat whenever you desire. 
If the place that the Lord your God will choose to put his name there is too far from you, then you may kill any of your herd or your flock which the Lord has given you as I have commanded you, and you may eat within your towns whenever you desire. Just as the gazelle and the deer is eaten, so you may eat of it. The unclean and the clean alike, may you may eat of it. Only be sure that you do not eat the blood, for the blood is a life, and you shall not eat the life of the flesh, or with the flesh, and you shall not eat it. You shall pour it on the earth like water. You shall not eat it, that all may go well with you and with your children after you, when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. But the holy things that are due from you and your vow offerings, you shall take and you shall go to the place that the Lord your God will choose. Now listen to this final two verses, and you um, offer your burnt offerings. The flesh and the blood on the altar of the Lord your God, the blood of your sacrifices shall be poured out on the altar of the Lord your God, but the flesh you may eat. Be careful to obey all the words that I command you, that it may go well with you and your children after you forever, when you do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. So what God is saying now is that he's talked about how not to worship him. You're not going to worship him like they're worshiping their gods in the land you're stepping into. They're being judged. You do not worship their gods. You do not worship me the way that they worship their gods. This is how you worship me. And it includes a corporate element and it includes a home life element. And the two are inseparable. And what God is saying now is that when you go into the land and as you grow, as you mature, and as your territory expands, <clears throat> if the place that I choose is too far to travel, then there is opportunity to branch off and have a place that's closer to where you and a community can gather. And we're going to talk about this later on with the idea of synagogues. But it's it's God is preparing them. Hey, look, you're not there yet. You're not there yet. You need to make the effort. Corporate worship is important. Now, when we get into the land and as territory increases, which means Israel is starting to increase as a nation and population, then God would allow them to start church planning. They would start presenting places that they could worship God and make their vows and their offerings. <clears throat> but until that designated time, they were to follow the rules. And what I love about this is that God is, again, he's got maturity in mind. And this comes back to you and I as believers. Do we trust God with the rules that he has in our lives today? Do we trust God when he says, no, not today, for the things that we desire and we want? And I, and I, and I mentor quite a few men and women in, in the church, even at Cornerstone, and there's anointing. There is anointing there. But we have to mature in that anointing. We have to grow into that anointing. And if we're not careful to be patient, to allow the Spirit of God to do His job through the training and equipping that I, the elders, and the church leadership are pouring into those who have anointing. What was meant to be a blessing can become a curse to them and a curse to those around them. And that's why it's so important to be patient and to trust the Lord our God. He has our best interests in mind. He is the one who has anointed us. He knows how to mature us into the anointing. And when the time comes, we will step into it empowered to share it, to live it out in ways that will allow, in turn, them to replicate that into the lives of others who are just discovering and growing into their anointing. So God always has that blueprint in mind of replicating, of growing and diversifying. And I think that's wonderful. And we see that in the New Testament with the New Testament church constantly. As they grow, they're branching out. They're branching out and starting other churches and communities where the believers are, are surfacing in. But this heart of this passage comes back to the corporate worship setting. To be careful to know God, to know his word, and to walk obediently with him. We need that corporate setting, that corporate in the home life. You cannot have one without the other. And in, you cannot have a healthy relationship with God if you're just worshiping him and doing what is right in your own eyes on the home front. We need that corporate setting. Here are two New Testament illustrations to show that this is still a very real uh, factor in our walk with God today as it was for Israel then. I'm going to read from Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 47. Uh 40, Acts chapter 2, verse 44 reads, And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions, belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. 
And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And we see everything that we had just talked about compressed in those few verses. They were coming together as believers. They were giving above and beyond what they did not need, which was beyond their needs. They were giving to the church and tithe and offering to help reach and meet the needs of those that had not did, did not have enough. And as they would break bread together corporately, this would overflow into the breaking of bread individually in their homes. But that corporate setting was that magnetic place where they would come for the teaching of the apostles, be trained and equipped to live out God's word. And, it, and living out God's word would begin when they left in their homes. And then that would trickle out into their families and their jobs. And the kingdom of God increases. Just like God said, hey, look, Israel, my goal is to increase you. And what I'm giving you is a schematic right now because we're children. But as you grow, as you mature, things will look a little different for you as you step into that maturity. Trust me in my timing. Trust me with the rules that I have in place right now. And it's the same thing with the New Testament church. Trust God. With the leadership and the structure that he's put in place, be faithful to it, submit to it. And in Hebrews, it says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Yes, God is with you in your home. God is with you around that dinner table. But to not be a part of a corporate setting of worship is disobedience to God. Disobedience in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. And so I want to encourage you as we draw close to this. I know we have uh, some who, who follow our studies that aren't a part of Cornerstone Chapel. And I think that's wonderful. I pray that you are blessed. All the resources, the training, and the ministry we offer free of charge. Uh, we have I have freely received it from the Lord. We as a corporate church have received freely from God the blessings and the fruit and the anointing of the Spirit. And we share that out. But I want to encourage you, wherever you're watching, if you're not a part of a local church, you really need to be. And I want to encourage you uh, to reach out to me. I'll help you find where you are at, local to you, a healthy place to where you can come, hear God's word, celebrate life, and be trained and equipped into your anointing to live for Christ, to see his kingdom come and his will be done. Would you pray with me? Father God, as we draw this study to a close tonight, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, it's just so incredible to me when I see these threads of truth that begin in the old and flow into the New Testament and are a very real part of our lives today. As, as a family, it's always important for you to you, Father, that we gather around that table at family dinner time. Corporate worship is that time to where we celebrate the family that we are in Christ. Father, I pray that you would find us knowing you, being careful to know you with intention in your word and prayer and sound biblical teaching exposition. Father, I pray that all that are listening and watching would continue to discover the anointing you have placed over their lives for a season such as this. May they not only identify it, but grow into it. Father, I pray that, thank you, thank you that your kingdom is present and is coming. Your spirit is here and you are very active, Father, in the lives of your saints to continue to cultivate and prepare the world for the return of your son, Jesus. Bless us now, I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining me tonight. Until next time, take care, God bless, love you all in Christ. Bye.